Okay, here's how Miro works. See, it's amazing. What's everyone doing at David's desk? Ever since marketing started using Miro's collaborative online whiteboard, he thinks all our other teams should sign up. Why? He says Miro's making his meetings disappear. And if every team gets on it, that means even less meetings. They're using Miro for brainstorms, mind maps, customer research. So could we use Miro instead of having another hundred meetings for every round of feedback? Yep. You can comment, react to ideas, even leave a recording on the board. And what about presentations? There are Miro templates for that. How do you know so much about Miro? I've actually been using it all along. I just used a Miro board to plan the best vacation. Okay, I'm on board. See how Miro users save up to 80 hours every year by meeting less and doing more. Get on board at Miro.com with three boards free forever. That's M I R O.com. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 268 The Battle for Malaya and Singapore. When we last left the Pacific Theater, the island of Borneo, with its vast oil reserves, not to mention impenetrable jungles and headhunters, had become the latest Japanese conquest. Still, Britain's main hope, in a subdued kind of way, was Force Z, made up of the only British capital ships in the Pacific at the outbreak of the war, the battlecruiser HMS Repulse and the battleship Prince of Wales. But zooming out, the British Empire and its Commonwealth troops were in a precarious enough position at the end of 1941 as it was, not only in Asia, but in other theaters as well. In North Africa, Operation Crusader had just finished, which didn't so much defeat Rommel as he was forced back west due to a lack of fuel. Then there was the war in Greece and the Balkans that went the access way. And, of course, your proper belonged to Berlin and Rome. No, it was only in the Middle East that the Allies could feel good about their achievements. By keeping substantial amounts of men from India, Australia, and New Zealand there, and away from home. Thus, Iraq, Persia, and Syria were kept out of German hands, but having transferred so many troops from the subcontinent, Australia, and New Zealand— these very areas were now threatened, with Japan having entered the war. The Japanese had chosen their time of entry wisely. Yet London decided, and it was agreed to by the various governments, that India and the Antipodes would raise new regiments, and eventually divisions. But with so many new men suddenly in uniform, there weren't nearly enough weapons to arm them all even by reaching far back into the storage areas to lay hands on World War I weapons. There simply weren't enough. But the war in Asia should not have been the crisis it was for the Allies, that it turned out to be. Not having enough men should not have been a problem, for it was not their job to take on the Japanese, at least in the early phase of the war. No, that job was for the Royal Navy. But as we have covered, the Washington Naval Agreement in 1922 reduced the British Royal Navy to a one-ocean force, which was not missed by Canberra and Wellington, not that their words of concern were heeded. But as their nagging continued, London finally made a deal. If a major war broke out in Asia, the main fleet would be sent there. In fact, a major port would be built at Singapore to house it. But again, the Australians and New Zealanders brought up the possibility, what if there is an emergency here, but already a war in Europe? What then? London was silent, but could no longer afford to be after France was conquered. For clearly, the British Royal Navy would have to stay close at home. But that's when the Chiefs of Staff came up with their latest plan. The territories in Asia would be protected by a beefed-up RAF until such time as the Royal Navy could make its way out there. Besides, building more planes was faster and cheaper than building capital ships and their escorts, 
Hence, a new position was created on October 17, 1940, Air Chief Marshal, and the man chosen was Sir Robert Brooke Popham. As for the general officers commanding Malaya, Burma, and Hong Kong, they all now reported to Sir Robert. The idea was simple. The limited number of infantry and artillery would protect the various airfields. In turn, the squadrons on them would harass and hold back the Japanese until substantial forces could be brought to bear. It was the best London could do. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity? And how far would you go to stop someone who was getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. Early on, well, early enough, Lieutenant General Arthur Percival, General Officer Commanding Malaya and Singapore, after a personal inspection, saw for himself the ability of an enemy to attack down the Malayan Peninsula to get to Singapore, hence negating the impressive anti-naval guns on the island. In the end, he determined, he would have to rely on a combination of men, ships, planes, and large guns. In order for this teamwork approach to work, Percival would have to rely on his immediate subordinate commanders. Percival's main field unit was the Indian Third Corps, led by Lieutenant General Sir Lewis Heath. He had been the commander of the Indian Fifth Infantry Division, which had helped push the Italians out of Ethiopia. Then there was Major General Arthur Barstow, one of Heath's divisional commanders, yet he would not survive the war for Singapore. Another divisional commander was Major General David Murray Lyon. As the commander of the newly created 11th Indian Division, he and it were ordered to Malaya. Leading the Australian Imperial Force was Major General H. Gordon Bennett, Yet, for some reason, or reasons, he would be a disruptive element during the battle. Whether personal or professional, Bennett had a chip on his shoulder, which could have simply been nerves, as events would show that he was not yet ready to command such a large force. In the end, though, he would think himself right throughout the conflict and take action accordingly. As for the actual defense of Fortress Singapore, that would be led by Major General F. Keith Simmons. And assisting Simmons, Singapore had six early warning radars in southern Malaya, not so in northern or central Malaya. The problem was, the bulk of the British planes were stationed up north when the war broke out. But Percival's ace, figuratively speaking, was Acting Admiral Sir Tom Phillips, the main Royal Navy commander and his British Far Eastern fleet, made up of three World War I light cruisers, several gunboats, one modern cruiser, and five destroyers, all centered around HMS Repulse and the Prince of Wales. It would be his job to make sure the Japanese did not land troops directly in Malaya or on Singapore. However, should the enemy make land in Thailand, just to the north, well, perhaps he could make sure those troops never received reinforcements or 
further supplies. Either way, as Philip's Force Z went, so went the battle for Malaya and Singapore. London, in its thinking about a future war in Asia, decided to stick with its current configuration, which was respectable enough. The problem was, Percival had not a single tank on Malaya. Oh, he had plenty of anti-tank guns, but that's not the same thing. The British fighting unit was organized around the Infantry Battalion, made up of four infantry companies and a headquarter company with six three-inch mortars, machine guns, and anti-tank platoons. In total, just over 800 men. There was also, supposed to be in each battalion, 40 Bren light machine guns and 13 Bren gun carriers. Well, there was supposed to be 13 of them. But as the Far East Command was basically last on the list of shipments, this would not be so for the upcoming fight. And each man would have the respectable Lee Enfield rifle. The other vehicle was the Armored Carrier Vehicle, Indian Pattern, or ACV-IP. As for the anti-tank weapons, that was the 2-pounder, or 40 millimeter anti-tank gun, and the 25-pounder. Three of these battalions made up a brigade, totaling 2,500 men. As we have seen, the British powerful fleet never materialized. Then a massive air arm didn't either. So it would be up to the ground troops to defend Malaya and Singapore. But when the war came, Percival only had 31 infantry battalions and no armor. He had wanted 48 battalions and two armored regiments, and they had been possible. But Churchill held them back, as he did not think the Japanese would attack as early as they did. So, those forces were sent elsewhere. GOC Malaya Percival's battalions formed three divisions, two Indian and one Australian, yet each division only had two brigades, not the full three, and were relatively light on artillery. This left two other brigades in reserve and two fortress brigades at Singapore, along with their coastal artillery and anti-aircraft guns. And lastly, there was the small garrison at the Penang Fortress, just off the peninsula's northwest coast. But hopefully, the Japanese would never get that far, much less further south to Singapore. Overall, Percival had 88,600 men, but none had combat experience. They had not trained together. They were not used to the environment and were ill-equipped compared to the Japanese. Whereas the three divisions of Japanese forces attacking had plenty of experience and were given more armor than normal. And General Tomoyuki Yamashita had a solid overall vision of what he wanted. The Japanese fighting man excelled in night fighting and at close quarter, yet the Empire's weaknesses were logistics and intelligence gathering which meant they would need to take the initiative and hold on to it. The Japanese attacking force was the 5th Division, which had 860 trucks. The Imperial Guards helping them had 660 of their own. And finally, the 25th Army under Yamashita had 160 light and medium tanks. The fleet bringing the Japanese 25th Army to Malaya and southern Thailand was escorted by seven heavy cruisers, two fast battleships, which had been modernized but were still inferior to the Prince of Wales, and 30 destroyers. Because their carriers were heading to Hawaii, this attack would have plenty of land-based fighters and 99 bombers. There would be 25 of the elite A6M-0 fighters, which were superior to all the British planes in the area, and another 48, though older, fighters. Still, these latter fighters were better than the Buffalo Brewster, and on par with the Hurricanes that came later in the war. The attacker's plan was kept simple, based not on overwhelming numbers, because they did not have that during this campaign, but surprise and fighting prowess. 
to come right at Singapore with its coastal batteries, its two nearby capital ships, and anti-aircraft guns was seen as suicidal. No, better to land in southern Thailand and make the 400-mile trek south to Singapore. Again, speed, audacity, and experience should get the job done. As for the last leg of the battle, the crossing of the Strait of Johor that separated Singapore from Malaya, well, that's what engineers were for. Overall, once the Japanese had their men on shore, the plan was to stick to the two coastlines, as the peninsula center was occupied with a mountain range. Still, the coastal areas had swamps to contend with, but that was better than climbing a seven-foot thousand mountain. But one of the biggest factors for both sides was the weather. Malaya is hot and humid, which can suck the vitality out of anyone not acclimated and the British-led troops had not been there long enough to adjust, while the Japanese had been toughened by years of fighting in China. Of the many reasons that Percival's troops did not have more weapons and more men, that was because of Churchill, who, like FDR, was sending what he could to Stalin to stave off the German attack there. Churchill strongly believed that the Japanese would not attack in 1941, as that would mean war with the United States, which he did not think they were capable of. But as we have seen, Japan, by this point, was forced to choose between a desperate war and national humiliation. They chose the former. The British Chiefs of Staff agreed with their Prime Minister that Singapore had to hold out until such time as a large navy could be sent there. That meant Malaya had to hold out, as it protected the massive port. However, the massive air arm never arrived in Asia, nor could a large navy, so the basis of the British plan to hold out, or to even retake their possessions at a later date, was built on nothing. But it got worse for the British-led Commonwealth forces. Not only was communications problematical, An RAF man was in overall command. His immediate subordinates were of the army, and their main defense was to be from a navy man, and their defensive dispositions were equally without logic. The main air bases were in northern Malaya, which is where they guessed the Japanese would land first, and they knew they did not have enough troops to hold back the Japanese from taking those airstrips and using them to attack Singapore. Further, the objectives of the differing branches were not in sync. Percival wanted a solid defensive line set up 30 miles north of Singapore. The RAF wanted their air bases in the north strongly defended. And the RAF had won that argument, which made sense. If the Navy could not get there in time, then the air power was all Percival had, So the bases had to be shielded, but that was the equivalent of putting all their eggs in one basket. If the airfields were kept operational, the Japanese could hopefully be bled to death. But if they fell, then it would come down to infantry fighting, and the Japanese had the experience and stronger desire to win. Be that as it may, the Indian Third Corps were to defend northern and central Malaya, the 8th Australian Infantry Division, would defend Johor to the south. With such impossible odds against them, it should be none too surprising that Commander-in-Chief Far East, Brooke Popham, came up with an idea that was outside the norms of warfare. Simply, as the only viable place the Japanese could land with their troops was in Singora and Patani in southern Thailand, It stood to reason, but perhaps not international law, that if the Indian troops occupied them first, then the Japanese would be starting off with a clear disadvantage. The idea for this preemptive attack was called Operation Matador, and it was sent to London for review. In London, there were many discussions, not the least which was, how would the Americans react to this violation of a non-belligerent country. 
But in the end, Matador was technically approved, but it came with so many strings, it would be useless. It should be noted that the British had guessed much of the Japanese attack plan. Not that it mattered, for the defenders did not have enough men who were too scattered out to support each other, did not have enough planes, certainly not up-to-date ones, and not enough ships. It's noble to say, hold out as long as you can, but that brings little comfort to the fighting men, who knew that their own superiors thought they would lose. It was just a matter of when. Thus, the stage was set. On December 4th, 19 convoy ships, carrying most of the Japanese 5th Division, left Hainan Island, which is parallel with northern Vietnam, in the South China Sea, while seven other convoy ships departed the next day from Saigon, modern-day Ho Chi Minh City, in modern-day southern Vietnam, about half the distance closer to Malaya than the main convoy. They were to meet up in the Gulf of Thailand, on the morning of December 7th. To avoid giving away their presence, they sailed as close to shore as possible, hoping British patrol planes did not spot them. Still, on December 6th, around noon, a Lockheed Hudson light bomber and coastal reconnaissance aircraft spotted several vessels some 80 miles south of Cape Cambodia, in between southern Vietnam and Thailand. But for C&C Brook Popham and Percival, the question was, where were they going? To Bangkok, at the top of the Gulf of Thailand, to invade there, or Malaya, or southern Thailand? With this question unanswered, Operation Matador could not be given the green light, as it would be the British who first violated someone's border. Still, all British forces were put on alert. Then the rain and clouds rolled in, which allowed the convoy to disappear. Not until 5.30 p.m. on December 7th were the ships reacquired, about 110 miles north of Kota Baru in northern Malaya, seemingly heading to Singora in southern Thailand. Further, another convoy was spotted north of Patani, just below Singora. But for whatever reason, none of this information made it back to Far East Command until late that night. Yet again, the question was, where was their final destination? It would be counterproductive to deploy the troops, only have to redeploy them somewhere else. Time answered the crucial question. At 12.45 a.m., December 8th, Japanese troops began landing at Kota Baru, on the eastern coastline, just a few miles away from the border with Thailand. Soon after, reports of this landing made it to headquarters from the 8th Indian Infantry Brigade and the RAF airfield there. Right away, as they were capable of nighttime operations, several Hudson Light bombers took off and used the moonlight to engage the enemy ships nearby. One was sunk, another two were damaged. To look at the pathetic landing barges used by the Japanese in this southern attack, it was clear that they needed to be unopposed and have calm waters. That night, they had neither. First, taking on the heavy swells, the barges struggled to reach the beaches, but waiting for them were the Indian troops manning beach defenses and as daunting as it was to try to force themselves inland against the defenders, it was better than dealing with the rough seas. The barges had to make three trips to get the Kota Baru invasion force ashore, but once they did, their professionalism and fighting prowess kicked in. The contest for the beach went on for three hours, but by then the Japanese were able to advance, reaching the center of the Indians' line. With a hole punched through, the airfield, not two miles away, was now threatened. With first light, two Malayan battalions were ordered to push back the invaders, yet the experienced Japanese troops, having fought for years in China, were undeterred and continued to advance. The sun continued to climb, 
as did the temperature. Still, the Japanese moved ever closer to the needed airstrip. Seeing this, around 4 p.m., the order was given to make the airfield unusable. But it seems this order was premature, or it did not come from the right authority. Hence, it was not carried out in a thorough manner. Only the facilities were gutted, not the actual landing strips. Not that it mattered. The British planes left for more inland locations. As evening came, more Japanese transport ships were spotted. Having lost the beaches and then the airfield, at 8 p.m., the British brigade commander gave the order to formally fall back from the ruptured defenses along the beach and make for Kota Baru proper, behind the airfield. In this way, the beach and the airfield was lost on the first day. With the British-led forces disorganized and the Japanese troops continuing to enact the philosophy of General Yamashita's driving strategy, additionally impressive gains were made the next day, December 9th. It was the same for December 10th, as two more airfields were captured at Machong, about 30 miles due south of Kota Baru, and Konggengda, about the same distance, but closer to the eastern shoreline. Like the Kota Baru airfield, the facilities were bombed or fired, but the landing fields themselves were left operational. The Japanese 3rd Air Division had every reason to be thankful to their infantry comrades who had given them this incredible toehold at the outset of the war. Meanwhile, in southern Thailand, troops from the 5th Division had reached their landing areas at 2.20 a.m. on December 8th. Not two hours later, they started coming ashore at Singora and Patani, 300 kilometers and 200 kilometers northwest of Kota Baru, respectively. But most importantly, these landings were in southern Thailand. While the Japanese came ashore at these sizable port cities, the Indian Third Corps was trying to decide whether it should launch Operation Matador, or even a smaller version of it. By having only one battalion, called Krokal, enter Thailand and take up a position along the ledge, along Pantani Road. Operation Crow Call, the name comes from the town of Crow near the border, and Call is short for column, was the smaller version of Operation Matador, as one brigade was to be broken up into three columns. Of the three, the most important one was called Crow Call, and its objective, if allowed to move forward, was to race to the ledge, a height that had a road some six miles long cut through it. If that could be destroyed, the rubble would block the road the Japanese troops would use to come from Patani, which was closer to Malaya than the other two landings in southern Thailand. This would give the 11th Indian Infantry time to retreat in an orderly manner or set up ambush points to slow down the invaders even more. But only after Matador was officially cancelled was Krokal given the green light. But by then, the right troops were not in place. They had been preparing for Matador. So the three columns set out, late and under strength. The main unit of Operation Krokal was manned by the 3rd Battalion of the 16th Punjab Regiment, along with engineers and heavy trucks, all under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Henry Moorhead. There were to be additional troops coming along, but they were still en route, so were left behind. Crow's objective, the ledge, was about 30 miles away. But right away, the columns ran right into, and began fighting with, the Royal Thai Police from the town of Betong. Other Thai police were fighting the Japanese along the coast, as a ceasefire had not yet been signaled. As the Thai police had more than just handguns and had placed logs across the roads, Crow Force was delayed, not even reaching Batong until the afternoon of December 9th. This came later that day, and when the Thai mayor there found out that Thailand was not the British objective, they were let through 
with an apology. But for some reason, Moorhead did not even then leave the town until the next morning, December 10th. That delay would hurt Percival's entire undertaking. The 316th Punjab under Moorhead headed out that morning of the 10th, but the leading Japanese forces, in better physical condition, having landed at Patani at 3 a.m. that morning, reached the ledge first, around noon. But not wanting to give up just yet, Moorhead had his column break into three companies and fanned out, hoping to outflank the enemy and drive them back. But between the Japanese holding the heights, their light tanks, and aggressiveness, the companies were soon bogged down. Moorhead team was able to dismantle a bridge, but rebuilding that would take no time, compared to had they been able to block up the six-mile-long narrow ravine along the ledge, which held the only road south. The best Moorhead could do was stay at the bridge location that night of December 10th and hope to hold back the Japanese from rebuilding it. The next day, December 11th, Moorhead started receiving word that his other companies and the other columns had suffered heavy losses at the hands of the Japanese. It seems that the day before, December 10th, Company A, led by Sudabar Sher Khan, which had been about 700 yards in front of the bridge, had spotted an approaching Japanese unit, which had tanks. The company laid down and let the first two tanks pass by. Only then did they rise and attack the Japanese infantry. Khan was hurt, but continued to encourage his men. The Japanese retreated in confusion. But soon after this, another Japanese unit came, again, men and tanks. But this time, they came in at a run. The first tank literally ran over Shere Khan, who could not get out of the way in time because of his wound. Company A inflicted a few more casualties, but within minutes were practically wiped out. Nine wounded soldiers were able to crawl into the jungle. By noon of December 11th, Company D had made their way back to Moorhead, having lost only 15 men. But that afternoon, the Japanese attacked Moorhead's now reinforced position three times. The last one, just before dark, was the strongest, and during it, the Punjabis lost all of their vehicles. In exchange, the Indians' two-inch mortars destroyed the enemy's artillery. Moorhead knew their position was quickly becoming untenable, as the Japanese were assuredly flanking their position. So Moorhead sent a request to retreat back to Beitong, but had to await approval. So the night of December 11th was touchy, as the Japanese were known for favoring night attacks. Luckily, the attacks never came, but that meant the enemy was focusing on swinging around the bridge position, hoping to cut off any retreat. Sure enough, at 7 a.m. on December 12th, the Japanese attacked again, and this time from additional directions of east and south. Moorhead knew he had to get his men out of there, so told the various companies to fight their way out. Lieutenant Palmer's Sikh company managed to flee south, but lost 30 men in the process. Whereas Captain Sasson's Dogra company was surrounded, still a few of them managed to evade the Japanese and headed back to Beitong. Yet Kasson and his second in command were never seen again. Moorhead's column, with only four Bren carriers left, began to move out. But right then, two of his vehicles were hit by enemy shell fire. Moorhead ran to one of the still operating carriers and ordered it to move. It was then he spotted a wounded Punjabi soldier. Jumping down, Moorhead grabbed the man, put him over his shoulder, and ran back to the carrier. Only then did the remains of the column begin to leave. On his way back to Peitong, Moorhead's column passed by Lieutenant Colonel Stokes' 514th Punjab, which was setting up a defensive line just north of town. Moorhead's survivors made it to safety, But the leading units of the Japanese reached Stokes' line 
just behind the Indians. Yet, instead of engaging, the attackers began to reconnaissance the area, obviously waiting for reinforcements. As the sun rose on December 13th, the Japanese hit Stokes' line with infantry and light tanks. One tank was taken out, and enough infantry were killed or wounded to cause the attackers to pull back. Stokes knew that, again this meant, enemy troops were swinging around his position. But there wasn't anything he could do about it. He barely had enough men to hold back the main attack along the road. Prudently, Stokes and his men pulled back that night. Petong was abandoned, with the British-led forces now re-establishing themselves at the town of Crow, about eight miles away. The two other columns of Crow Call had not fared any better than Moorhead's. If they had, his center column would not have received so much pressure. As things stood, any preemptive attack in southern Thailand, to slow down or interfere with the Japanese landings was impossible. The Japanese would be coming south, and soon. It was now out of the hands of the infantry, who could only do so much, and in the hands of the British Royal Navy. If they could ensure no additional enemy landings of men or supplies, then perhaps Singapore would be safe for a few more weeks, maybe even months.